Hello and welcome to the program. Popular TV personality Volodymyr Zelensky has accepted the concession made by Ukraine's incumbent president Petro Poroshenko and is now set to become Ukraine's next leader, according to exit poll results. The election process has largely been deemed as smooth and fair by the international monitors here. Joining us now to talk more about the assessment of the second round of the presidential election is Olya odinska Hrod, deputy head of the election observation mission run by Canada M, an international non-profit NGO. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So what can you tell us about uh, the mission's assessment of the of the second round of the presidential elections? Uh, we just had our press conference this afternoon at 12.30 and um, have said that the election was fair and free. And um, we were very encouraged by the large number of voters that came out. We were very encouraged by the um, very uh, professional conducting of the electoral process at all of the um, precincts and the districts. Our observers actually attended uh, 2,366 individual precinct offices across uh, all 24 oblasts where there are elections being held. And uh, so we had um, a very good, broad spectrum um, to have a look, and we're very positive about the, the findings of how the process actually unfolded. So how would you rate it in terms of transparency and compliance? I would, it was rated very highly. Our report came back actually at uh, 97%, and I can give you our actual statistics of what our observers saw, and they said that um, the um, opening was at, all the um, compliance in terms of opening was at 97%, the voting at 98.5%, and the counting at 97% in terms of how, how did things go. So I think that um, we are looking at a very positive response to the mechanics of how the election was conducted and the procedures. So um, you have uh, around 160 Canadian um, election observers we that, do. That, that monitored the second round. And Correct. So how do you how do you observe the election process at all these different oblasts and regions and cities and towns with I, I wouldn't say a large number of, of staff? No, it's not a large number, but it is enough to give a um, overview and um, does allow us to have some critical findings. They have a tablet of questions. They go to visit the uh, precinct office and the uh, district offices in advance for a few days before. They they look at the voters list. They, they um, see how the operation is being set up, whether they have all of the committee in place. And then they come back on election day to certain ones and then they end up at the end of the day at, at one of the district closings. So we have, um, and they're constantly giving us their um, their information. So they are putting the information on their tablet. Um, they have an electronic tablet, and that comes right up to our headquarters here in Kiev. So we can tell how each group is doing, how many, you know, where they've been, how many um, precinct offices they visited, and we're getting the data continually. So it is a, um, I think, a, a, an advanced system. Um, it's working very well. We have good statistics. And I think with having a minimum of um, six to eight people in all of the oblasts of Ukraine where the elections are being held, it gives us a pretty good sampling. So over 2,366 polling stations uh, were visited in the second round. Not all on one day, but over the, the STOs were on the ground uh, two days before. And uh, previously, the long-term observers, we have 37 of them that have been here since February. So they have been on the ground and they have been visiting all of these stations as well as the short-term observers. So, uh, for example, when uh, one of your monitors hears of um, uh, hears of uh, you know a ballot paper that's that's being marked, or somebody trying to leave with a with a with a ballot paper from the polling station, what sort of steps do they did they take, or uh, what's the what's the protocol? Uh, the protocol would be to um, take note of it on their tablet, to, to transfer that information to our offices, and they would uh, let the head of the commission, perhaps they would speak with the head of the commission at that uh, location, advise them of what they have seen, but they do not get involved. It is not our job to get involved in the actual process. We observe it, we note it, we can record it, we can discuss it with the, the head, but we do not interfere. 
Do you uh, do you report back to the local authorities, or is that yes? We would mention it to the head of the commission of that precinct, who would then probably deal with the matter in, in an appropriate fashion. Mm. So, um, when you uh, when 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 you report on the violations, do you uh, do you have a, um, do you have any feedback? on it in terms of why someone might have done this or do you do any sort of analysis I think on it? it? Yeah, we do. Um, we do monitor um, any sort of situations or problems and then the observer has the option of going back. That's why they still are all out there in the field. Uh, today, and they're not coming back into Kiev until tomorrow, almost till tomorrow night. So precisely, if there was some kind of a skarha or a complaint, they can go back today and just see, you know, how was that dealt with? Uh, you know, did it come to a conclusion? Was it resolved? Maybe it wasn't so bad. Maybe it was worse. And then we also have our uh, core team in Kiev, where there are um, any cases which are larger that have been brought to any of the authorities. Uh, we have a team in the office and, of course, our um, legal analyst uh, who would then go to the court here in Kiev and listen and hear and take note and report on what they have heard and learned. Does the mission plan to stick around for the parliamentary elections and for the results and particularly when they will come in? For the parliamentary. Yes, we will be here for the parliamentary. We will, um, the observers, both the short term and the long term, will all be gone by um, the 27th of April. Our court team will stay here with our analysts until May 4th in order to write a final report. Uh, we have delivered our first preliminary report of the first round. We delivered our second preliminary report today on the second round, and we will write a final report for this entire procedure. Uh, we will leave on May 4th, and whenever the next um, uh, when the parliamentary elections are to be held at the moment, the date we have fixed is October 27th. We will be back in early September as a, a core team with long-term observers to begin the observation process for those elections. Mm -hmm. And then the STOs, the short term, uh, will come in just before the election. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues that was on the mind of the head of the election observation mission, Lloyd Axworthy, is the uh, whether um, there will be any Russian meddling in the election process. And uh, in, in, an, in an interview with the National Post, he said that there are some lessons to learn for Canadians. Um, and uh, I think Ukraine's on the front line and there's a wake-up call that anybody's election, including our, in six months could be altered. Um, after seeing the second round of the presidential election here in Ukraine. Uh, can you talk a bit about the mission's assessment of whether Ukraine withstood Russian Russian meddling, or if you, uh, or if the mission has seen any examples of this? In, in today's press conference, uh, Mr. Axworthy talked again about that topic, and um, there, there is a concern from from um, the Canadian side, so to speak, um, on the fact that there are 80 Russian language television programs or radio and television programs here that have a, a different message than perhaps one that other stations all have. And that, that is of a concern, you know, there is, there is a concern in Canada of um, Russian television and the disinformation that it appears to um, put forward even within our context in Canada. With our election, of course, we are very uh, closely monitoring um, how Ukraine with, withstood cyber attacks, which clearly they did very well because uh, all systems seemed or, or did hold place, and uh, which is really good news. So we have um, certainly some um, cooperative learning there. Uh, we have um, our team uh, who will have an opportunity to look at how that actually functioned through through both the Tsevaka, um, the CEC, and and other institutions. You know that that learning will be very important for Canada for sure. Mm. Um, a, a little bit off topic now. Um, Previously, you've talked a bit about uh, women in uh, in politics in Ukraine and how there should be a stronger drive to involve more younger girls and uh, young young women uh, in uh, different sectors of, of government. Um, what do you think should be the new president's um, uh, agenda when it comes to uh, any sort of um, uh, attracting young people to uh, politics? Oh, I, I think um, definitely 
there should be um, something in the agenda to address the number of women who have an opportunity to enter the, the political spectrum. Um, as, as when I was on your program previously with Tom, we, t we talked about the fact that there are some really good gender equality um, issues being addressed here. For example, your CEC, the Sevaka, is 16 members, nine of them are women. The, the key positions are held by women, I, and this is terrific. They're capable, they're wonderful. Um, there are other organizations, like currently in the, in the previous government, um, there, there were a number of women uh, ministers. And um, but it, it, it's, it sort of starts at home young with people feeling that I can do this um, and uh, education from a right from school and home and society to bring women into the political sphere. Um, we, we are very proud in Canada that uh, 50 percent or almost 50 percent of our cabinet um, is made up of women. And we're very proud of that. We would like to see that happen in other countries of the world as well, where, you know, let's face it, 50% of the population is women. And they are, while they may ha have some roles um, with, with, um, in traditional roles, they certainly are capable in many other roles. Do you think that there, uh, that, do you think that this, this should be a key issue for the next government? I, I do. I, I see it as, um, I, I, I heard today a comment that um, in the parliamentary elections there is um, a quota of a, apparently around 30 percent of each of the um, party lists should include up to 30 percent women. Um, you know, it's too bad that we have to have quotas to, to do what's actually a societal right, but um, if that's what it takes to get the ball rolling, then that's terrific. Um, we certainly, as Canadians, welcome that, and our government is is very um, in favor of that type of an approach to the political scene. Do you think uh, women empowerment plays um, plays a role in 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 the upbringing of of young? Uh, uh, of young U uh, Ukrainian families, for example, in uh, Canada, um, is there is there a certain? Uh, do you think there is a certain sort of um, uh, emphasis on the way that uh, young people are brought up uh, to, uh, when it comes to thinking about women empowerment and and, and these sort of sh uh, issues and gender equality and how how mm. does that fit into uh, Canadian uh, society? In, in our society, I, I think that the, the barriers are, there are still barriers there. You know, we, we talk about breaking the glass ceiling of the corporate world. Um, but when I look in Ukraine and I, you know, just a few weeks ago, I pulled open the, um, the Kiev Post and, and it's, you know, Ukraine's 100 top women. And, and it was very encouraging to see that. I know there's a very strong business council of Ukrainian women. And I encourage those particular groups and others to think about fielding candidates, get involved and... Um, you know, there, there has to be um, an education right from youth that we as individuals or we as women can, can do this. Um, I, I've always felt that, um, you know, just saying that we have to have X number of women just because isn't really the way it should be. It should be we have these people here because they're really good at what they do and they deserve to be here or they've earned their stripes and they're, they're going to they're gonna be part of the team. So I, I think that that only can happen if there's an open-mindedness and not a fear of, of uh, gender equality. So do you think it's about up upbringing and less about, you know, quotas and putting in certain st st statistics and certain numbers into it. I think um, having quotas is something that you need in the preliminary stages as you are trying trying to build that type of a civil society. And uh, when, once you achieve a, a more of a comfort level, then I think um, it, certainly merit is, is the key, is the key. But as we... Um, Socialize children at home, um, you know, teaching young girls that, you know, yeah, I can do that is really important. And, and I refer to the wonderful book that I've seen by um, your author, Babkina, which is, is a book for young girls. And it talks about, you know, Lina Kostenko, you know, your famous uh, poetess is, I can be like her or an astronaut or, or a singer or somebody else. And I think that kind of empowerment that, you know, I can do this. I think that's good. Excellent. I think that's a great note to leave it on. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.
So that was Olya Odinska Grot, the deputy head of election observation mission run by Canada M, an international nonprofit NGO. You're watching UATV. Thank <laughs> you.